Welcome again to the History Obscura Reading Room. I do apologize for the lateness of this episode. You see, once upon a time a wise and often helpful force came to reside in this house, and it is frequently enraged by what it views as confusing, demonic, modern appliances. I call it Colonel Butler. Anyway, Colonel Butler has promised to stay away from this particular wing of the estate while I engage in the witchcraft that is converting sound waves into binary code. I bought his submission with a tray of lemon squares and some rather powerful tea. I can't promise he'll keep his music down. Well, let us begin. Have you ever thought about how you might be walking on the roof of hell while gazing at flowers. Or have you ever just been stuck in traffic? Come on, move already! So slow. I am going to be late again. Does this sound like your typical commute? Sure, just cut me off, you- Ah, ah, ah. Let's be family friendly here. Let me adjust your dial. (laughs) Introducing the Road Tripping Podcast. Just sit back and relax while our hosts Dean and Molly entertain you with trivia, history, true crime, the paranormal, and much, much more. All in the hopes that your commute will suck just a little less. That's the Road Tripping Podcast with Dean and Molly. Once upon a time, in 1588, the 24-year-old Galileo Galilei was asked to give a lecture in Florence, explaining the specific location and dimensions of hell. The medieval clergy took this particular theology very seriously, and when Galileo was asked to work with Dante's poem and use his advanced knowledge of mathematics to determine the exact size and location of all levels of hell, he took the project seriously as well. At only 24 years of age, Galileo must have been a very prestigious citizen of Florence to have been considered for the job His own location probably had a great deal to do with it, since at that point in his career, Galileo was a respected teacher, published mathematical author, and faithful member of the church. Residing in the Duchy of Florence as he did meant that he was physically closer to the ultimate seat of power, that is, the Medici family and the Pope. The mathematician agreed and used the famous Dante's Inferno as his model. For a society whose daily lives revolved around the doctrine of the Catholic Church, theology concerning the content of the Bible was considered of the utmost importance. Even men of science, generally speaking, believed in the basic truth of Catholicism, and Galileo was no exception. Dante Alighieri, the original architect of the project, was a 14th century Italian poet. He was the author of Commedia, an epic poem in which the first part is entitled Inferno. The second and third parts are entitled Purgatorio and Paradiso. The poem follows the path of Dante, led by ancient Roman poet Virgil, through the nine levels of hell as he has envisioned them. Dante's model of hell is located inside of the earth, with each level descending deeper into the core of the planet. These descriptions were based on Dante's own research of the Bible and several other theological texts, including those of the Muslim world. In Dante's vision of hell, the most Heinous of sinners were brought to the innermost chamber of the earth, while lesser sinners dwelled in the outer layers closer to the surface of the earth. The materials that Galileo had to work with were all based on Dante's original poem. However, several artists and theologians had come up with their own physical representations of hell. Sandro Botticelli, the artist who drew Dante's Inferno, was probably more influential to this project than Dante himself, since his artwork gave physical form to the otherwise theological idea of hell. 
The following quotation is an excerpt from one of Galileo's own lectures on the subject of the location of hell. The size and depths of the inferno is as great as the radius of the earth, and its mouth, which is the circle turned about Jerusalem, has for its diameter an equal size. In making the computation according to the methods provided by Archimedes in his book On the Sphere and the Cylinder, we will find that the space of the inferno occupies a little less than one fourteenth part of the whole volume. I say this, if that space should extend all the way to the surface of the earth, which it doesn't, on the contrary, the mouth remains covered by a great vault of earth, whose summit is Jerusalem. The levels go turning round and round the concavity of the inferno, and the first, the nearest to the surface of the earth, is limbo. The second is where the sensuous are punished. In the third are castigated the gluttonous, the fourth holds the prodigal and the avaricious. The fifth level is divided into two circles, the first of which includes the Stygian swamp and the moats around the city. This is the place assigned to the pains of the wrathful and sullen. The second part holds the city of Dis, where the heretics are punished. Galileo calculated that the immense roof of hell not only encompassed Jerusalem, but that it stretched as wide to the west as Marseille, France, and as far to the east as Tashkent, Uzbekistan. In order not to collapse upon itself, the mathematician believed that the roof must be 600 kilometers, or 373 miles, thick. This second calculation used a famous rooftop as its primary model. That rooftop was the gigantic Duomo from the Florence Cathedral. A massive domed roof, the Duomo still sits upon the highest tower of the Florence Cathedral. Built by Filippo Brunelleschi in the 15th century, the famous dome measures between 30 and 60 centimeters thick. That's one and two feet. Ironically, Galileo soon realized that his calculations were incorrect. He had assumed that as a general rule, if you doubled the width of a ceiling, you would also double its thickness. The actual mathematical rule was, and is, that the cube of the thickness divided by the square of the span was a ratio that must be kept constant. When Galileo repeated his calculations using the square cube law, he found that the roof of hell would have to be so thick that there would be hardly any room underneath to accommodate all the dead souls of the past and the future. By the time he had corrected his own mistake, however, the physicist's work on the Hell's Roof project had earned him a brand new job at the University of Pisa. And so, he simply did not mention this crucial mathematical rule to anyone for five decades. It was only after being placed under house arrest at the age of 68 that Galileo finally wrote and published his square cube law in his final book, called the two new sciences. He was, by the way, under house arrest on orders from the Italian Inquisition. The Inquisition was extremely unhappy about at least two books Galileo had written on the subject of his use of a telescope to examine the stars. Galileo had been very excited to find that the Earth moved around the Sun, and not the other way around. The Catholic Church said no. It was January the 8th, 1641, when Galileo died at his rented home in Arcetri. As a convicted heretic, 
the astronomer was not allowed to receive a proper Catholic burial with a large service at the cathedral. Nevertheless, whatever the decision of the Inquisition and the Pope, Galileo's remaining family and friends knew that he had been a faithful Catholic throughout his life. They arranged a quick and secretive funeral the very next day, whereby they buried the great man at the bottom of the bell tower of the Basilica Santa Cross, near Florence. The grave was to remain unmarked, despite the repeated and enthusiastic attempts of the Grand Duke Ferdinand de' Medici to erect a statue. Half a century after Galileo's death, another Renaissance scientist by the name of Isaac Newton introduced his universal law of gravitation and the laws of motion. These precise calculations and observations of the movement of objects on and around the Earth finally proved that Galileo Galilei and Giordano Bruno and Johann Kepler and Copernicus were correct when they said that the Earth moved. As for the nine circles of hell, who knows? Dutch artist Lottie Jeven teamed up with geologists in the early 2000s and inserted a recording device 9,100 meters down into a borehole in Windeschittenbach, Germany. She was keen to discover just what was going on down there. Upon sharing her recordings, Jeven said, Some people thought it did sound like hell. Others thought they could hear the planet breathe. Thanks so much for joining me, everyone. Please, if you do enjoy the podcast, take a moment to go to patreon.com forward slash history obscura and become an official supporter. It's just $2 and you get lots of extra readings. Also catch me on Twitter at HistObscuraPod and on the Facebook group. See you next week. Good night. (laughs) 